Right, welcome back lads. This is the uh, another video on the T54. We're going to give you a look, uh, look around the interior this time. So with that, I'll pass you down to Johan to do uh, go around to the driver's position. Here we are in the driver's position. Now before I actually start talking, we were actually lucky enough to have our driver, the driver of our vehicle for the day, Malcolm run through the various controls, instrumentation, and how to start up a T54. So let's swap to that first. Okay, for controls in the tank, we have uh, three, uh, three, four gauges, uh, oil temperature, water temperature, oil pressure, and uh, charging current. Uh, we have a button here, which you probably can't see for uh, pre-lubing uh, pre -lubing the engine before starting it. We have the starter button here. And on the left-hand side, we have a there is a throttle, a throttle control, a, a throttle idle setting, which is what it really is. You can uh, adjust the idle on the tachometer here, this gauge here. On the floor, there's a clutch pedal in a conventional place, brake pedal in a conventional place, and, a, and a, an accelerator pedal in a conventional place. There are the two, the two tiller bars, which you can see here. So if I want to turn left, I pull this one back. It has two modes of steering. If I pull it back to the first detent, it turns gradually. If I pull it all the way back, it, it basically pivot turns on one track. And the same on the other side, there's two detents. And finally, I think there's the gear shift. So I've got uh, one reverse gear and five forward gears, which you can see here. And that's it. And as far as starting is concerned, I have to set the idle control, the hand throttle, to roughly that position. I have to pre-lube the engine. You can, you can see the pressure gauge reading just above 0.5 megapascals. Once it's pre-lubed, I hit the starter. Okay. Thanks, Malcolm, for explaining all that stuff. Now, just some nitpicking from me. So, as you guys can see, the mount for the driver's machine gun is right beside me. It shot straight out the front of the vehicle. And as we said in the exterior uh, features video, it is a differentiating feature for the T-54 because this is not a feature that was found on later Soviet tanks, such as the T-62, 72, 64, etc., etc. Um, also, Another point I found good on this tank was the latch for the driver's comp for the driver's hatch. The reason I feel it's quite good is because it doesn't require the driver to expose himself when he needs to close the hatch. Unlike earlier tanks or other tanks of the period, such as say the Sherman or the Centurion, the driver has a latch over to his left over here, which allows him to turn the hatch and close it. Also, another responsibility the driver had for the vehicle was fighting engine fires. So in the event that the vehicle is hit, a light would light up and let the driver know that there, the engine's on fire. What he would have to then do is close the shutters, turn off the fans, turn off the engines, and activate the carbon dioxide fire extinguisher system in the engine compartment. Uh, the fact that it's a carbon dioxide system is also quite important because there are some rumors that on later versions of this vehicle and on later Soviet tanks, it was a bromide fire extinguisher system, which could have been very toxic for the crew indeed. Now let's crawl through that tunnel behind me and go talk about the fighting compartment. All right, so here we continue on towards the fighting compartment. Note that if we were in combat conditions and for some reason the driver or someone from the fighting compartment had to go into the driver's compartment, this would probably take a lot longer, which, you know, if you play certain games, well, here's an idea of just what might have to happen when your driver or someone else gets taken out. And there we are. So here I am in the loader's position, and his duty was to uh, load the main weapon. To my left and rear, as well as my rear right out in the hall, there are mounted racks of ready-use ammunition used to achieve the 7 rounds per minute average by T-54 loaders. 
as well as in the uh, hull in the front of the vehicle there is a rack of 25 extra rounds of ammunition problem with that is that the way it's mounted you can't access it if the turret is anything but facing direct forward the types of ammo carried in this vehicle in particular would have been high explosive fragmentation as well as armor piercing discarding sabo Further variants of the vehicle would carry as well armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo, and anti-tank guided missiles. Now, another very interesting feature is that this vehicle has a loader's periscope in front of you, as well as to just to its left, an extractor fan. Now, moving on to the breach, main problem here is that there's no sort of safety features, no guide rails, nothing. Thing is, anybody could get behind the weapon, and if it recoiled when you were behind there, it would have crushed you, split you right in half. Speaking of the recoil, however, unlike that, this next feature was quite enjoyed by the crews. The fact that you could make a quart of alcoholic liquid out of 1.5 liters of the, uh, of the recoil system fluid. Quite, la quite enjoyed to be sure. One final thing to note is that right now I'm standing on the main fighting compartment escape hatch. So if you had to get over here in a hurry round the end of the breach, that would be trouble. With that, I'll pass you over to Johan to do the uh, gunner's position. So here we are in the gunner's position. Directly behind me is the driver's position and the small tunnel-like area that you have to climb through if you want to go from the driver's position into the main fighting compartment. Not very spacious, I guarantee you about that. Now, to my left is the gunner's main tool, the 100mm D10TG main cannon. And all around me here are controls he has for the gun. So the sights, the traverse and elevation controls, and other useful things like that, such as a periscope. Now, let's get on to the specifics. The sights themselves are most likely what the Russians would refer to as a SH-2A-22 sight. It's got ballistic drop compensation lines for five different types of ammunition. And it's also got an optical rangefinder, or rather, optical rangefinder lines printed onto the site itself. Now, we know for sure that the set of lines marked OF are for the high explosive fragmentation rounds. The lines marked GT are for the machine gun. And we can only assume that the other three sets of lines are for different types of armor piercing ammunition, or well, different types of ammunition. I would presume that the set of lines all the way to the right with the least ballistic drop compensation are for high velocity armor piercing rounds, but it could be different. If you know, put it in the comments below. Um, as well, the sight has two options for magnification, 7 times and 13.5 times magnification. You can change that with a switch. The optics themselves seem to be really good, they're pretty clear. However, the eye relief is pretty bad, so that could be a problem if the vehicle is constantly moving. Now, on to controlling the gun itself. The gunner has access to electronic fire controls found here, as well as a manual trigger for the cannon over here. To traverse and elevate the turret, the gunner can do this electronically, or he can also do it manually with these handles over here, as with many other military vehicles. One thing interesting about this system is that the gun actually cannot be electronically traversed, elevated, or fired when the driver's hatch is open. Pretty interesting safety feature there. Also, because this vehicle has the electronic elevation, it means it's also got electronic stabilization, making this a T-54A model, and not a later early version of the T-54 as we presumed in previous videos. The gun itself can also be used in an indirect fire support role, uh, to do this, he's got the elevation markers here and the azimuth over here. In this case, it allows the gun to be fired like an artillery gun and it can fire shells up to 15,600 meters. Some other interesting points while we're beside the gun. The gun itself can actually be lo locked in three different elevations. It can either be locked level as it is right now fully elevated or fully depressed depending on which pin you decide to use. Um, on that vein, there's also another thing that we came upon during research for the, doing research for this video and that was 
that Soviet regu regulations did not permit for the gun to have a loaded round while the vehicle was on the move. We might be wrong if you all, again, if you know better than us, put it in the comments. We'd love to know. Now let's move on to the commander's position. So here we are in the commander's position. Now, the commander's role in battle was to, well, command the tank, maintain a good situational awareness, communicate with other tanks, and make sure everything goes well. Tell the driver where to go, tell the gunner where to shoot, and to look for targets himself. So to help him do that, the commander had his own periscope. Uh, the periscope is able to rotate 360 degrees. It's mounted to the hatch, and the hatch itself can be locked in any direction, which is quite good if you're looking for targets. Now, on the optics itself for the periscope, there is a range. There are lines for for range finding printed onto there directly. On both sides of the main periscope, there are also smaller periscopes. And on the hatch itself, there is a periscope to look directly to the right of the vehicle. Now, one issue with this is, and it also has to do with the age of this vehicle, is that there is no, there are no facilities for night fighting at all. There's no night vision, uh, no electronic viewfinders whatsoever. However, on later versions of this vehicle, on the T-55, there were electronic fire control systems and obviously night vision and thermal optics. Now, another important feature that the commander has at his disposal is this, the radio. On earlier Soviet vehicles, such as the T-34, they had no radios, only the commander's tank had radios, which meant they had, to, they had to communicate with each other using semaphore flags or hand signals. But with this radio, the tank commander is now able to communicate with other tanks, and they can coordinate offensives, etc., et anything else, without exposing themselves to enemy fire outside of the tank. This is extremely important when you consider the losses that the Soviets took during the Second World War, especially at large battles such as Kursk. That's about it guys, thanks for watching. And thanks to the Ontario Regiment Museum for supporting us too. If you guys want to help them out, because they help us make our videos, feel free to donate to them. They have a Guardian program which we've linked to in the description below. It's a monthly donation. Uh, you guys can also check out their Tank Saturdays and their Aquino Weekend, which they host every year with reenactments and tanks running around, obviously. Thanks for watching, guys. See you around.